let, please let me know if you can see my screen. We can see it clearly. Perfect. So without any further ado, let's uh, start the presentation. Um, people who have actually um, been part of my previous presentations would know that we started on a, on a series of different uh, systems that are used in oil and gas applications for artificially lifting the fluid all the way to the surface. We started with the ESPs, electrical submersible pumps uh, in the first lecture, and then we talked about the gas lift systems. So in continuation of that journey, we are going to talk about the progressive cavity pumping systems um, in today's presentation. Um, I'm very excited to be here to bring this uh, in front of you and show you guys how important this method is in different part of the world uh, to bring energy all the way to the surface. So um, we will start with a, with a brief agenda on, uh, on uh, what artificial lift systems are, what different systems are available in the market um, uh, commercially, um, how they fare in respect to each other in terms of capabilities and performance, and uh, what is a progressive cavity pump, what are the different subsystems of this uh, system, um, what are the advantages and what are the constraints or limitations of this system? And uh, what are the new exciting developments that are coming up in this field? So what is artificial lift uh, as, a, as a concept? Why, we do, why do we need it? Where is it applicable? Um, whenever we drill the oil and gas well, there are two types of conditions. Either the reservoir pressure is enough is high enough to push the well fluid all the way to the surface. This is what we call a natural lift. Uh, so drill a, drill a well and without any um, additional system, you will get the fluid all the way to the surface. Um, in this case, uh, you will deploy your tubing and once you will be done with your perforations, you will have enough, uh, uh, your well bore pressure is low enough so that the delta pressure or the differential pressure between the, the, the reservoir and the well bore is enough to push the fluid all the way to the surface and you will get the production um, on the top side. Sometimes this is not the case, um, especially when you have mature fields, you will drill a well and the, the reservoir pressure is not enough to push it all the way to the surface. In this case, when you deploy your tubing and when you uh, complete the perforations, um, you will get the fluid to a certain level in the well bore, and after that, it doesn't have enough energy to go all the way to the surface. In this case, you deploy what we call artificial lift systems. These are different type of pumping systems uh, that can be deployed uh, downhole uh, to push that fluid, to give it that extra energy so that it can get to the surface. Um, there are different type of artificial lift methods that we have um, available commercially. Uh, and these are available with a lot of success. Uh, we have uh, what we call gas lift systems. Um, then we have electrical submersible pumps, hydraulic pumps, beam pumps. Beam pumps is something which you guys must have seen very commonly in the oil field. It's like kind of an icon of the oil field whenever we talk about oil patch. Um, beam pump is something that comes in everybody's mind. Um, one of them is what we are going to talk about in this presentation is the progressive cavity pumps. Now, all of these artificial lift methods have their constraints and their positive and advantages. Um, some of them, for example, gas lift systems um, and electrical submersible pumps are really good for uh, what we call um, high rate applications. So all the way from 200 barrels um, of fluid per day to 300 barrels of fluid, 30,000 30, barrels of uh, fluid per day. Uh, so they are used very commonly in offshore applications. But there are, uh, for example, in the onshore applications where the flow rates are not that high, uh, then we use uh, progressive cavity pumps, which are good until uh, 4,500 uh, barrels of full fluid per day. Um, and there is reciprocating rod lift or the or the plunger lift uh, uh, that we see commonly, uh, which are good for the low uh, flow rate applications. 
um, then some of these methods are good for solid handling um, and uh, gas handling. For example, gas lift systems are excellent for the gas hand handling, um, while electrical submersible pumps, which are more sus sus susceptible to uh, gas locking, they are not very good if you have very high uh, gas to oil ratio. Uh, then pro progressive cavity pumps are really good if you have solids um, in the fluid stream while in case of ESPs, they are not very good in handling solids. So they have their own niche applications uh, uh, where they find their good fit. Um, when we have very high uh, uh, temperature downhole, uh, ESPs which are good to 200, and there are some ESP systems which are good until 300 degrees Celsius, while in case of PCPs, they are good until 100 degrees Celsius. Um, for high temperature applications, we have to go for a non-conventional PCP or, or a metal on metal PCP, which we are going to touch up briefly um, in the coming slides. So this is just a generic um, uh, slide of where these different artificial lift systems find their niche. You will see for the low, low rate, uh, no medium rate applications, hydraulic lift and uh, PCPs find their application. While in case of gas lift, uh, it finds its application in high rate um, where you are looking at 50,000 barrels, 30,000 barrels kind of a range and very deep applications. So their gas lift and CESPs are very common in um, deep uh, sea applications, subsea applications, uh, offshore applications, while hydraulic lift and PCPs are more common uh, for shore applications, low rates. So what is a PCP? Um, let me just start with a bit of background on the PCPs. PCPs were actually invented by Rene in 1932. Uh, they were very common as a surface pump. They are very commonly used in outside oil and gas as a surface pump or a transfer pump applications, uh, for example, in, in uh, food and beverages uh, uh, applications, they are commonly used as a surface pump. Uh, it wasn't until 1979 when PCPs actually found their application as uh, a pumping system in uh, oil and gas uh, sector. And they first started uh, as, as a PCP in heavy oil wells for Canada because uh, heavy oil is very difficult to move. It has a very, uh, it, the API uh, range is less than 18. Uh, so it's very thick, it's very viscous, it's very difficult to move. So conventional means of artificial lift systems like plunger lift, uh, rod lift, ESPs and gas lift were not very good in moving that thick viscous fluid. Um, so in 1979, uh, PCP was deployed as a means of moving that fluid all the way to the surface. And since then it is very, very commonly used in heavy oil applications, in tar sands, um, and in the medium oil application, which range between 18 to 30 APIs. Um, in, in a very, it's a very simple system. It just have one moving component, which is a rotor. And the rotor is actually, it's a, it's a helico axial rotor deployed in a double axial uh, stator. Um, uh, the rotor is the moving component. Sorry, the rotor is the moving component um, and the oh. stator is a stationary component. The rotor is usually uh, made up of a metal uh, with a chrome plating while the stator, which is the outside uh, uh, casing is made up of a tube with a elastomer actually injected into it. That elastomer actually forms the double helical profile in which the rotor will actually move. This is uh, just a, a real life cutout of a rotor and a stator. The rotor will rotate, the stator will remain stationary. Um, you have your injection at the very bottom and then it will push the fluid all the way to the surface. So the, rot uh, the fluid will move around the cavities uh, in the stator and the rotor is actually the one which is pushing the fluid to the surface. Um, in a very simplistic form, it's a helical uh, positive displacement pump. Um, the rotor forms a single helical while the last uh, elastomer filled stator will form the double helical. Uh, <clears throat> usually we deploy 
um, the PCP at the very end of the production tubing, um, where the stator is actually connected with the production tubing and rotor is actually connected through sucker rods from the surface um, all the way uh, to downhole. Uh, we are going to see the entire system um, in coming slides. As I mentioned earlier that uh, the stator is actually filled with elastomer or the elastomer is actually injected into the stator tube. Uh, this elastomer is very critical in PCP applications. We have different elastomers for different well fluids. Um, usually if you have very heavy oil, we go with what we call a high dietrile soft rubber, which has um, slightly lesser uh, shores hardness. You can see over here, the shore hardness of a high dietrile soft is around 55. Uh, while for the high nitrile hard, which is used in the medium oil and light oil applications, it's around 68. Um, and this elastomer kind of forms the heart of the PCP. If you don't select a correct elastomer, you will have an early failure. Um, and this table kind of gives you a brief generic introduction of <clears throat> if you have high sand, and if you have, if you want, if you have H2S, hydro, uh, hydrogen sulfide, in your well fluid, then you want a high nitrile soft. While in case of your, if the sand, the sand contact is the content is low, uh, your temperature is high, and your aromatic content uh, content is high, then you want uh, high nitrile hard. Uh, one of the things about the elastomer is that once it comes in contact with the well fluid, it will expand. So your interference with between your elastomer and your rotor will increase, um, and that is very critical to understand because. Uh, if you select the elastomer incorrectly and your elastomer expands and your interference increases, there is a possibility that your pump will become, will start losing its efficiency because now it has a lot of interference between the elastomer and the rotor. So usually uh, field by field, your elastomer selection will, will differ. And usually for the mature field, they have a very good understanding they will have a very good performance data on which elastomer will work uh, with the with the reservoir fluid uh, that they have so um, it's it forms the core of the of the pcp system um, generically for the sandy wells for heavy oil applications we use hns or high nitrile soft and for the medium oil and low uh, and the low api oil uh, or the light oil applications we use high nitrile soft Um, a bit more on uh, performance of the PCP, just by changing the, the rotor profile, we can have a big change in the flow rates. Um, and we are going to touch a bit, bit uh, more in detail in the coming slides. Um, but the rotor is actually a precision machine uh, part of the system. It is plated with, it is usually made of carbon steel and then it is plated with chrome or chrome alternatives. Uh, we have some chrome alternatives as well, but in 80 to 90% of applications, your rotor is actually coated, uh, coated with chrome. Uh, this is to prevent the wear in the rotor because the rotor is constantly rotating in the stator. Um, so you want some sort of a coating on the rotor surface to reduce that uh, wear and tear. Um, then the stator is actually aligned with the last tumor and we have talked about the last tumor in bit detail uh, in previous slides. How does the entire system actually looks like? Um, we have what we call a top drive at the very top. Um, this top drive will provide the power uh, to the rotor, which is deployed downhole. Um, we have a power unit. The power unit is simply a, um, there to provide a three phase 480 volts uh, on location because some of the locations can be quite remote and you don't have power on the location. Um, the drive head is, there is a motor on the drive head and it actually converts that uh, uh, electrical energy to mechanical energy and that mechanical energy is transferred through the sucker rods to the pump, which is deployed downhole. Um, then we have a PCP well manager with a, with a variable, variable frequency drive um, over here on the well surface. Um, this is uh, this does a couple of things. Number one, it provides control, so you can uh, change the frequency, uh, and then that frequency will change the the RPM of the of the pump uh, downhole. 
um, and that is very critical because um, you want to have that flexibility of changing the RPMs of your pump uh, if you want to go from, let's say, 100 RPM to 500 RPM to increase the flow rates or decrease the flow rates uh, in the vice versa case. Um, this PCP well manager uh, also has some intelligence built in it. So if it starts sensing that your downhole pump is failing, it will start. It will send a signal to your CCR or central control room. Uh, it can also reduce the speed of the pump it, uh, if it feels that it is failing. Uh, but that depends upon the capability of the well manager. Uh, some of the customers prefer a plain Jane um, variable frequency drive where you just have a, a speed pod where you can control the speed of the PCP. Um, some people want intelligence built in the in in their VFDs, and that's where the well site controller will come in. Um, from the from the drive head all the way to the downhole pump. It is connected through what we call a rod string. Uh, the rod string is actually made of uh, uh, what we call sucker rods. These sucker rods are connected from the drive head all the way to the PCP downhole. Uh, the tag bar is, we are going to discuss a bit more about the tag bar in uh, the coming uh, slides, but essentially it is there for space out uh, once you deploy the system. And the torque anchor is there to hold everything in place and prevent uh, PCP, PCP from untorquing the production tubing. Power units. There are two types of power units. One are there with the electrical generator to provide uh, power to the electrical motor. Uh, the others are there to provide hydro hydraulic power because we have the ability and flexibility of providing either um, a hydraulic motor or a, uh, or a or an electrical motor on site. Um, some customers prefer hydraulic motor because it's just more reliable than an electrical motor in their cases. Um, some customers prefer electrical uh, motors on site. Um, what you see over here on the top uh, uh, right hand side, it's a it's a it's a genset genset based power unit uh, which is providing electrical energy. Oh, sorry, in this case, hydraulic and uh, hydraulic power to the uh, uh, what you see over here in the orange is a hydraulic motor. So it is providing hydraulic power to that hydraulic motor and that hydraulic motor is actually through the pulley system is driving the downhole pump. Um, in some cases we have hydraulic motor built as a part of the um, uh, drive head system, which you can see at the bottom left over here. Um, in, in this case, uh, you have much more smaller footprint and then uh, uh, you are getting a hydraulic power from the power unit. Variable frequency drives, uh, these provide us the flexibility, as I mentioned earlier, about uh, either reducing or increasing your pump speed. Um, they have more to it. For example, they have what we call a soft start. So rather than, um, uh, rather than having a jerk start to the PCP, which can result in a rod breakages, it provides you a very soft start in which you start with five to 10 Hertz of frequency, and then you ramp up all, it, all the way to 50 Hertz or 60 Hertz. Uh, they also provide us our data log and troubleshoot capability. So you can actually trend the performance. Uh, if you have a controller installed in the variable frequency drive, and it gives you a PCP well management options as well, so you can actually, or by changing the RPMs of the pump, you can actually alter your flow rates. Um, some of the intelligence that is coming now uh, built in the PCP controllers is that you have torque limitations. So if you see a certain amount of torque, for example, 700 foot pounds of torque, uh, and your limit is actually set to uh, 600 uh, foot pounds of torque, then it will sh automatically shut down the system to prevent it from breaking the rods or damaging the pump. Surface drive head. Um, this is another key part of the, the surface uh, equipment that is required for the PCPs. Essentially what happens is that it will convert the, 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 the electrical energy of the motor to mechanical energy. Um, the motor will provide 3,600 RPM and then through a pulley system or a gear system, it will be converted into um, 100 RPM or 200 to 500 RPM. Um, the PCP is limited to 500 RPM. We try not to go above 500 RPM. That's most of the manufacturers will uh, recommend. 
So uh, that pulley system in, that is contained inside the surface drive head will provide you the flexibility of, of uh, getting the RPMs that you want down home. Um, it also have a couple of other purpose, purposes. It has the what we call uh, uh, thrust bearings built inside uh, the drive head system. And they are taking this, the weight of the rod string because the rod string weight can be quite high and uh, something needs to bear that weight. So the thrust bearings built inside the drive head systems will provide that uh, uh, weight bearing capability. Um, it also provides you with the flexibility of getting the, the desired RPM that you want for your downhole pumps. Um, essentially, it also provides you with the ceiling assembly over here, which is which you can see. Uh, this provides the ceiling around the, uh, the sucker rods. Um, so the, you do not have uh, uncontrolled exposure of the wellbore fluid um, to the surface. So a couple of, uh, couple of different um, purposes that a surface drive head will actually um, fulfill. Rods and, uh, and tubing string. Um, rods are, are uh, kind of, they, they play a very pivotal role in transmitting that surface energy to, to the downhole pump. Um, the rods usually come in the form of a 25 feet rod and then we actually connect them. Um, so series of, of rod, series of rods are actually connected all the way from the downhole pump to your surface drive head so that you can have that power transfer. Uh, common sizes of rod uh, for very uh, low RPM and low flow rate applications, we use uh, three quarter inch rods, uh, but for most of the PCP applications, the rod application, the rod size starts from seven eighths. Uh, which can uh, take, you can see different, um, we have different uh, rod limit or torque limits on uh, um, different sides of rods and then different grades of rods. So in its, in its most basic form, a grade D alloy um, 7 8 rod has a torque capability of, a torque delivering capability of around 735 foot pounds. Uh, but as you go to one inch rods and then inch and an eighth rods, your capability increases from 1100 to 1500 um, foot pounds. And then as you increase your um, rod or improve your rod material, for example, you go from grade D rod to grade D special, which is alloy 75 uh, or, or alloy 96, then uh, you improve that uh, torque handling capabilities of the rod and you can, uh, you can improve the performance of the system. Um, usually for the high flow rate applications, we use one inch to inch and an eight rods just because they can handle more torque. Um, one of the things that you need to um, be cognizant about is that as the rod diameter increases, um, the space around, uh, because these rods are deployed in the production tubing, right? So space around the rod will decrease. Um, so it will affect your flow rate. So you have to judge the capability with the performance. Um, and the, the, the performance that you, the, that you want from your pump. Uh, so these rods continuously make up all the way from the surface to the downhole. So heads and flow rates. Uh, so API uh, governs or controls the PCP uh, designations or PCP models. Usually uh, the first uh, two letters, uh, for example, if a pump designation is 60K1200, 60 means your uh, your flow rate or the, your tubes meter uh, per day. And then uh, 1200 means um, the head rating. For example, that means that it can pump all the way to 1200 meters of uh, vertical head. Uh, the PCPs are very, very modular um, uh, systems. Um, the modular in a way that they usually come in the form of a standard element. Uh, that element will have a certain lift capability. Uh, if you want to increase your lift, you go from one element to two element, and then you will double your uh, lifting capability. For example, in this case, uh, you have a 40K 600 element. That means it can provide you uh, 600 meters of vertical head. Um, but if you want to go to 1200 meters of vertical end, you just do combine two elements together and weld them. 
Um, then similarly, if you want to compound that lifting capability, all you have to do is weld more elements and then you will get more um, uh, head rating uh, in terms of uh, your pump. So PCP displacement, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the geometry of the, of the rotor has a, a key thing to play um, in your pump capability. Um, the higher the pitch, the pitch is usually your crest to crest or a trough to trough uh, distance. Um, so from one uh, peak to another peak, that's your uh, pump pitch. So the closer the pitch is, uh, it can handle more, the pump can handle more solids. It has more aggressive pitch, so it can, it can, uh, uh, it can have higher sand content in your reservoir fluid. Um, but also what happens is that by decreasing or increasing the pitch, um, you increase your PCP displacement as well. Um, so PCP displacement has a have very simple formula, which is uh, uh, four multiplied by displacement uh, diameter of your pump multiplied by eccentricity, which is uh, the centric distance uh, uh, between the lobes of the pump and the pitch of the stator. Um, what you can see is that the PCP displacement is directly proportional to the pitch of the stator. So by increasing the pitch, you are increasing the, the PCP displacement. So it can actually pump more fluid to the surface. Um, and then to get the complete flow rate, you have to uh, multiply your PCP displacement with your number of turns per day. So uh, theoretical versus the actual flow rate. Um, so theoretical flow rate of a pump is, uh, this is directly related to the formula which I showed in the previous slide, is directly related to your pump displacement multiplied by your, your rotational speed. So if you want more uh, flow rate, uh, you either increase your pump pitch or you either you increase your rotational speed. Something which is, if you have already got a pump which is deployed downhole, the only thing that you can complain that you can, uh, control in this case is your rotational speed. So if you want more um, theoretical flow rate, you increase your rotational speed. So you go from 100 RPM to 500 RPM, you will get more fluid to the surface. Uh, one of the concept in PCPs is that uh, your, there is a difference between your actual flow rate and your theoretical flow rate. And the difference is what we call a Q slip or the, uh, the slippage rate. Uh, that slippage rate is dependent on multiple factors. It depends upon the viscosity of the fluid. It depends upon the efficiency of your pump. Um, it also depends upon your elastomer. Uh, so for the soft elastomers or high nitrile soft elastomer, you have slightly higher flow, uh, flow slippage rates. And for the hard elastomers, you have less slippage uh, rates. Um, so the Q actual, which is that uh, the actual flow rate that you will get in this on the surface is the difference between the theoretical flow rate and the slip. One of the things about um, PCPs is that it's a rotating component, so there is always this concern that uh, by rota by ro that rotational force it will untalk the production tubing. So usually we deploy a torque anchor, which is at the very end of below the PCP at the very end of the production tubing and it kind of anchors the tubing and prevents it from rotating. So tag subs are essentially, it's just a tube um, with a pin in it and uh, it, is, it is used for spacing out uh, your rotor. So what happens is that your rotor will be, uh, you will lower the rotor connected with the suck rods from the surface um, and you will go all the way to uh, the tag bar, which is can, which can be seen in the sequence B. Once it tags on the tag bar, you know that you have bottomed out. So now um, you will give the slack uh, on the on the sucker rod string. Uh, the weight indicator on the top side will uh, once the slack is given, the weight indicator at the top side will show zero. That means you have totally bottomed out, and now you can actually start uh, lifting your rotor. Uh, you lift by uh, you, lift, you lift your rotor by certain uh, height, and then you know that essentially that you are uh, completely in the stator. Your rotor is completely in the stator, and you can start up your uh, system. Essentially, it's just a space out uh, assembly that we use. 
what are the different advantages of the PCP systems? Uh, we have discussed in, in, in great detail about uh, how it is efficient in terms of uh, medium to low uh, flow rate applications or production rate applications. Um, it is very, uh, uh, it can, its effective production depths are until uh, 260, uh, 2,600 meters, and it can work in uh, tar sands, heavy oil applications, where you have highly viscous fluid, um, and uh, you have high uh, gas content. Um, it's really good for high sandy applications as well. Um, and it's not only used for in oil and gas, but it's also used in uh, coal, uh, coal bed uh, methane applications and uh, dewatering applications as well. It has a very, very small footprint uh, compared to other um, artificial lift systems. Um, and the capital expenditure requirement or the initial uh, expenditure requirement that is used for deployment of the system is very low compared to other systems. This is just a comparison, a side-by-side -side comparison of a, of a pump jack with a, with a, with a progressive cavity pump. Uh, both have same uh, flow rate applications or the full same flow rate uh, capability. Um, these two systems by side by side, you can see a, a big difference in the in the footprint between the two systems. This is just a, a, a comparison of uh, the uh, of a PCP with the with the ESP and the rod pumps. Uh, the PCP, as you can see, they have efficiency of almost 40 to 70%. They are usually considered the highest efficiency artificial lift system just because of the ability to convert that electrical energy to mechanical energy is just higher compared to ESPs because in ESPs we have our electrical losses. Uh, it's a lagging load. So you have uh, some loss over there as well. Rod pumps, just because it's, it's a huge system, um, it's a very mechanical system in which the energy transfer is not that good. So uh, compared, to, um, uh, compared to PCPs, the efficiency is quite low. So, um, and also in terms of capital expenditures, the PCP has the lowest capital expenditure requirement compared to Sakharov pumps or ESPs. Some of the limitations of this system, is, as I mentioned earlier, Lastomer is, is a, a limitation. Um, you cannot use the elastomer for high temperature applications. So anything above 120 to uh, 130 degrees Celsius, uh, there is a lot of constraint um, in, in, the, in that. Uh, PCPs are not really good for high temperature applications. And then speed limitations as well. As I mentioned earlier, that most of the, most of the manufacturers actually limit uh, their elastomer uh, PCPs to 500 RPMs. Uh, that's the maximum system capability, anything more than that. You have uh, the, uh, it just uh, decreases your pump life. It doesn't give you the longevity that you need from the PCP system. And it also increases the failures in different components. So uh, speed limitation is, is uh, one of the key factors as well. The backspin control is also important. Backspin is that, let's say if your well shut down uh, for any reason, uh, all the fluid that you have in the tubing will actually fall down. Uh, back into the reservoir. When it falls down back into the reservoir, it provides a counter rotation on the PCP. And get that counter rotation needs to be controlled because uh, if we don't control that counter rotation, it can actually dam damage the surface components. So backspin control is very important and backspin control is something that is built up uh, in your surface drive heads. What is up and new in the PCP technologies? Uh, as I mentioned earlier that uh, um, one of the ways to counter the elastomer in the PCP is to have metal on metal. So you have metal stator and a metal uh, rotor. Um, they have high reliability, they have high longevity, um, and they can actually alleviate some of the concerns that are related to the temperature limitations in the conventional PCP. So it can go all to the temperature, uh, to higher temperature all the way to 350 degrees Celsius. Um, in earlier in my presentation, I mentioned that most of the rotors are actually chromed um, to reduce the wear and tear. Um, so the manufacturers are coming up with new uh, rotor coatings. Uh, one of them is a nickel-based coating, um, which is more harder. It can provide more longevity 
and it can reduce the wear and tear of routers. That means you can get more reliability out of your farm. The other thing that is coming is, um, and it has started gaining a lot of traction around the world is the rodless PCP. That means you don't have suck rods running from surface to the, to the, um, to the downhole pump. Essentially, uh, the surface drive head has been removed and the motor has been deployed directly below the, below the PCP, um, which you can see in the string uh, deployment. So you have a permanent magnet motor at the very end and then it is connected directly through a flexible shaft to the PCP. Um, and then we have pump intake between the pump motor and the, and the PCP. Um, in its entirety, it's an entirely different topic to discuss because it, it essentially changes the, um, the, the dynamics of the, of, the, of the system. So um, the rodless PCP are getting more traction because by removing that uh, suck rod between the, the the PCP and the and the surface systems, uh, you are removing a big component of the failure that that used to be a cause of grief for many operators. With this, I would like to conclude my presentation. Uh, PCPs are uh, it's a very mature method of production which has been deployed across the world, and very uh, for example in in a lot of cost sensitive markets, it has much less capital expenditure compared to other artificial lift systems. Um, it has superior performance in terms of handling solids and wax, um, and, uh, but it has some limitations in terms of temperature, in terms of RPMs, um, and in terms of how deep you can uh, set uh, conventional PCPs. Um, it's one of the best methods of lifting heavy oil and in steam-assisted gravity drainage uh, applications around the world. And it, re it reduces the cost of uh, lifting heavy oil to the surface um, all the way to $3 per barrel compared to $8 to $10, which are used in, which are most common in other artificial lift methods. With this, uh, I would like to end the presentation and we can take some questions. Thanks. Uh, if any of you have a question, you can use the hand reaction to raise a question or leave a comment in the chat. So let's wait a couple of minutes to see if anyone wants to participate. Okay, we have a, a question from Alfred Edo, Ado. Let's see what they have to say. Sorry, Antonella, what is the question? I'm trying to to ask them to unmute themselves. Uh, let's go with Augusto Lotti da Silva first then. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, my quick question. I mean, first I have to uh, congratulation. congratulate you for that. It's interesting. Uh, listen, every day we learn something new and this is uh, uh, not, not really new, but uh, uh, it's, uh, something we hear, but we, sometimes we don't understand. Uh, I was saying the PCPs, the uh, progressing compression uh, something. <laughs> uh, uh, my question is, how do you extract the uh, the crude or the oil itself from the water, you separate it from the water? To bring it down to the uh, I mean from the bow uh, I had terms like well bore uh, it should be the whole, the whole itself right so how do you start the, uh, the gas or the uh, the crude from that whole well bore to to the container or to the vessel or something like that it does does not mix with water or how do you what's the technique you use or something that was running on my on my head as you were explaining the pump the pressure and everything could you clarify that? 
Sure. Thank you, Christopher, for the question. Very interesting question indeed. Um, I will probably dissect that question into two parts, uh, separation of water. So uh, uh, for the PCPs, uh, there is no separation of water. Uh, they cannot separate water from oil. Um, so it comes at parts part of the well bore fluid and then you have surface separators, your three phase separators to, to uh, separate uh, oil from water. However, in case of gas, it's a different story. Um, for the PCPs, uh, dependent on the application, if you have high gas to oil ratio, uh, to reduce that gas going into the pump, we have what we call gas separators, uh, which are essentially, um, uh, they, are, they have veins that are built to prevent gas from going into the pump and only letting fluid to go inside the pump. So we have some separation that is done downhole, uh, but, but that is only limited to gas, not for water. Okay, let's see what Gabriel Arup has to say. Hello, yes, uh, everyone. Thank you for the presentation. It is uh, really more technical. And uh, my question will be, uh, yeah, we know the oil production uh, is one of the uh, industry or one of the things that bring very high income to the governments and to the uh, oil companies who are working in the in the oil uh, production. But in some areas, you will find uh, these uh, oil companies and the government, they really don't care about the impact of the oil production. Like in some areas in South Sudan, you will find uh, the areas of the where there is a oil production is really very polluted. Is uh, people are living there and they are really living in very risky situation. Uh, you will find some deformed uh, uh, children uh, born uh, deformed. You will find animals also infected. Uh, and people are dying some in some areas. So, what are the real, what are the measures need to be taken by the governments and the oil production who are working in the oil industry to avoid to avoid all this impact into the local communities? Thank you, Gabriel. Um, I guess I can um, answer that question in a very generic terms. Uh, in terms of social and economic um, effects of the oil production, um, I think uh, uh, the environmental responsibility on the oil companies is, is quite great. Um, some of the things that are happening right now is that uh, a lot of oil companies are actually going towards em em emission reduction model. That means, um, they are trying to reduce the, the well site uh, footprint. They are trying to reduce the methane emissions from the, from the oil wells. Um, that's where advancements in the, the, the artificial systems are also coming in. Um, we are trying to develop systems which are more efficient, uh, more reliable, and does not emit as much of uh, emissions as they used to be. Um, for example, in, the, in case of PCPs, uh, they are electrically driven, they are, driven, they are small, uh, they have good sealing capabilities, so they do not let uh, well bore fluids go out on the surface or uh, leak into the surface. So I guess uh, the owners will come back to the oil companies to adopt these technologies and, and invest in, in getting the modern systems so that they can not only reduce their well site emissions, but also prevent any damage to the environment through the leakage of the uh, well bore fluid. Do anyone else have a question? And uh, let's see. Uh, from Alfred Addo in the chat, he says, um, please, I want to know the length of the PCP pipe, the depths that it can go. The length of the PCP pipe? 
Yes. Okay. So uh, there is length limitations uh, on the PCPs. Uh, the maximum uh, that uh, at least what I have seen is uh, close to 38 feet. Um, and usually that comes, uh, there are two reasons for it. Uh, one of that is that anything more than that and uh, um, you won't be able to transport it uh, on the roads. Um, so there is transportation limitations. Um, the other is that uh, these, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, these are very modular components, right? So if you want to get a higher lift, you just keep on welding elements. But by keep on welding different PCP elements together to just get the lift that you want, it reduces your uh, uh, the flexibility in the, in the system. That means, what, what do I mean by that is that by reducing the flexibility in the system, it won't pass through the, the deviated portions of the well, the slant portions of the well. Um, so you have to, so there is a length limitation and that is primarily due to um, you want your PCPs to pass through the deviated portions of the well uh, without actually damaging the system. From the chat, we have another question um, from uh, Augusto Lotti da Silva. He says, ah, he says, uh, what if the gas is separated from the water and good and itself how the petrol is come up. Sorry, I didn't understand that. I don't know. Let's see what they have to say. They had a hand raise. Okay. Uh, no, actually, this was my other question, only that my mic went off. I could not bring it back. No, my question, uh, on my question, you said uh, that uh, uh, gas is separated. See, it's, it's different. It's, com it's more compli complicated, different from the, from the uh, crude itself. So my question is, so if you separated the gas, how will the, 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 the crude, the petrol or the crude itself, we come up? Sure. So uh, let me just go to a slide where I show the entire system. So what happens is essentially uh, you have your gas separator somewhere over here. Uh, okay. Your gas separation will, sorry, will will happen over here, and once your gas is separated, you have water and oil uh, that will go into the intake of the PCP, um, and once it goes into the intake of the PCP, you have that helico axial rotor uh, that is rotating inside the stator that will move that uh, crude all the way to the surface. It provides and imparts sufficient energy to the crude so that it goes to the surface uh, through the production tubing. So in, in other words, the gas is the, the tools to push that thing up? Huh? No, no, no. So the gas will go into the annulus. The annulus okay. is the space between the casing and the tubing. Okay. Um, the gas is not going to push anything. Uh, that's for, for using gas, that's another system which is called a gas lift system, which we are not going to talk about over here. Okay. Uh, the PCP rotor, which is being rotated uh, inside the stator, that is essentially um, uh, moving the fluid to the surface. Okay. Yeah. Clear. Thank you. Yeah, another question from the chat um, from Edwin Nana. Uh, is there any difference between water pumps and oil and gas pumps? Yes, many main differences. Number one is uh, uh, water pumps are used for very shallow applications. Um, so maybe a couple of meters uh, to a couple of hundred meters. Um, PCPs can be deployed all the way to 2,800 meters. Um, they usually consume more power than water pumps, and they usually have more higher uh, uh, 
there is more technology involved to them uh, just because of the the conditions that they have to uh, encounter in terms of well bore fluid there can be h2s uh, they can be sand there can be abrasives um, in the well bore fluids so you actually need better better systems better reliability better materials um, but also in terms of uh, depth they are they are set at a at a at a higher depth um so you need so your power application your power requirements are much more higher than water pumps do anyone else have a question you can write in the chat or raise the hand We have, have a it. question from Hello yeah. Guru. Hello mm -hmm. Guru. Let, let's see what they have to say. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you very much. First, I would like to congratulate you for your presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm calling you from Maputo, Mozambique. Um, I studied at the AIU. At the moment, I'm working at the water supply company. So the last one who asked about the water pumps and the oil, that's the same thing I would like to ask if this kind of pumps, pumps oil pumps can be fit for the water pumps. Is it in? The first normal for the for pump water pumps and oil pumps. Can we use the same an analogy? Thank you, Elio. Essentially, yes. Uh, a pump is a pump. Uh, whether you use it for water, whether you use it for oil, whether you use it for um, moving uh, progressive cavity pump actually finds its application in multiple industries, not only just oil and gas. They are used in mining for demining, uh, for dewatering applications. Um, they are used uh, as a surface transfer pump in, in sewage plants. Um, essentially, a smaller version of this PCP can also be used in the water plants. Um, it can move anything that has, uh, uh, that is liquid, essentially. We have. We have uh, two, one more question. Let's see what Muhusuma Timothy has to say. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation. It's actually so nice. I'm inquiring about when the PCP pumps are always used because now right now, um, uh, I work. I work at a breathing rig or oil and gas breathing rig, but I don't. I really don't understand much about how and when this is really used. Sure. So uh, PCPs are commonly used uh, not during the drilling phase. It's used primarily when your completion is completed, your well has well head is deployed, and then uh, you start production. Uh, so it's primarily used in the production phase of the life cycle of the well. Uh, the why we use PCP and not other methods of production, or why would we choose this one rather than ESP or other methods of artificial lift, is primarily based on a couple of factors. Uh, number one, uh, what is the flow rate that you require? Do you need? Do you need? Um, how many barrels of fluid do, do you need? If your barrels of fluid requirement per day is 4,500 barrels per day, then PCP is a good application. But if it's more than that, then you essentially should go to ESP. Uh, 
the other reason is the, the presence of abrasives and solids in the in the in the reservoir fluid. Uh, if you have sandy content, uh, then uh, PCP is a better application. But if you don't have a lot of sand in your reservoir fluid or your production fluid, then in that case you don't need PCP. So there are multiple factors. Uh, some of them are related to your uh, well site conditions, the availability of power, uh, and then the others are related to your uh, well bore fluid. Uh, what kind of a fluid you have? Is it uh, heavy oil? Is it medium oil? Is it light oil? If you have light oil, then PCP may not be the best choice of uh, artificial lift. But if you have heavy oil, uh, something with an API less than 18, uh, then you need PCP. Uh, let's see what it, let's answer these last three questions from July, Paula. Let's see what they have to say. Hello. Seems like his microphone is not working. Um, can you hear me? Now, yes, now we can hear you, yes. You, okay. Sorry, I was trying to, to use my headset. Okay, I'm talking from Mozambique. And uh, my question, in fact, is was answered in terms of the PCP can, um, can be applied effectively um, for the heavy oils instead of the lighter ones. So uh, my next one is, which would be the, uh, the best and the suitable uh, mechanism of lifting the lighter uh, uh, fluids, including the natural gas, uh, when the, the underground pressure is reduced and cannot be uh, lifted naturally to the surface? All right, thank you. I guess the uh, for the lighter fluids or the lighter uh, API grades, um, the most the more suitable method is either gas lift or ESPs. Um, if you have high flow rates, if you have low flow rates, um, then rod lift is more economical method. In fact, rod lift is most economical method, um, whether it's light oil or medium oil. Um, 